All right, welcome everybody. Um, we are very happy to be here, and today we're going to present Riddle Media's Android Puzzlers. My name is Stefan Linzer, and I'm on the Android Developer Relations team with... Hey, I'm Richard Heinemann. I'm also on the Android Developer Relations team. Yeah, thanks for coming along. Today we're going to present some uh, fun, quirky, and in-depth Android puzzles. So let's get started. So when we came up with the idea to this talk, we thought we have to come up with some very awesome at the beginning. So um, <clears throat> we actually thought, what is something that most of the people don't know? And our first puzzle is called, uh, which comes first? So um, have you ever asked yourself which Android component is created first after your, after your application process um, has been spawned? So we're going to make this a little bit more fun <clears throat> um, and make it a little bit more interactive with you guys. So um, we're going to make this a little poll. So you can see four components here, activity, broadcast, receiver, content provider, and service. So um, please raise your hand if you think that activity is the first component that is created. OK, a few. Um, what about broadcast receiver? I, it's, it's hard to see. There's a more few people more. saying broadcast <clears throat> receiver. Um, what about maybe a content provider? Oh, that's like a lot. 15, Maybe it's a content me. provider. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what about a service? Okay. okay. Again, a few. So the audience um, thinks it's the content provider. So we'll see. The answer to the question is <clears throat> um, we have to dig a little bit deeper into the framework to answer the question, actually. So what you can see here, or what I will show you, is a sequence diagram, um, which is a very simple version of what actually happens in a framework. Um, but <clears throat> as we get through it, we will see which is the first component which is actually being created first. So what we can see here is the activity manager, one of the essential services, which is created at the very beginning. And so what the activity manager services does, it, it uh, calls a factory method on the activity thread and it creates the activity thread. The activity thread uh, then asks the activity uh, manager service to attach the application. Um, <clears throat> the activity manager service then loads some classes into memory, um, which are required to uh, start the actual application. And during this step, the first component um, <clears throat> which is created when your application is started is the content provider. Oh, congratulations, so, audience. Yeah. We should have got some beer left over from the Java <clears throat> posse for the whole audience. So, you are basically right. It's a content provider. Um, but just to finish this off, after that, <coughs> um, the activity manager then asks the activity thread to bind the application, and then the application object is created. And after that, activities and services and broadcast receiver come into play. So <coughs> let's have a look at hash maps. OK. So how do you make a hash map more efficient? The second puzzle. Uh, hash maps are very convenient. They've got good lookup times. Uh, but they're not that great on memory usage. And as you know, with Jelly Bean, we were looking at dejanking the UI, making it all a lot smoother. With KitKat, it was all about memory. It was all about bringing that operating system down so it worked great on a, a phone with half a gig of RAM, 5 to 12 megabytes. So whilst they were doing that, the Android engineering team noticed these hash maps in use throughout the, through the, uh, the Android OS. And for hash maps which aren't too full, maybe you say they've got less than 100 elements in them, the overheads of the, of looking up the elements aren't outweighed by the memory benefits. So the team went away and they built the array map. The array map has an integer of hash codes to index the objects and values, the keys and values. The benefit of this uh, being that the, of the arrays can grow and shrink very aggressively when you're adding and removing values from them. Even better than this, it's in the support library, so you can use it uh, throughout your code as well. They also made the simple array map, which the array map is based on. The simple array map doesn't have all those container functions that you might need, container APIs for a hash map, the get values and get keys kind of methods. So it's a much smaller object itself. So if you're converting from hash maps to array maps, you might want to do that. But if you're writing new code, you could use simple array maps, and you'll get the benefit of not only is it smaller objects, but they're much more efficient as well. And if you're only uh, having maybe 100 objects in here, you're going to find that the lookup times of the binary search aren't actually that much worse than the lookup times from the hash table anyway. To go one step further, we have the sparse array and the long sparse array. So if you're uh, mapping ints to objects or you're mapping longs to objects, then these things have got primitive index arrays. So you're not boxing and unboxing uh, into integers and longs the whole time. And you get less objects created. It's even more memory efficient. And 
that's going to save precious resources, great for, for KitKat and those low memory device phones. We can go one step further again uh, with the sparse int array and the sparse Boolean array. If you're converting, uh, mapping ints to ints or ints to Booleans, these things are now uh, primitive keys, primitive values. And with that, this was actually an API level one. So it brings us all the way back around to the start of Android when the engineers were trying to pack things onto the, the HTC One. So when they had a relentless passion for optimization of a flexibility. So just having a quick look at the data structures, if you are using hash maps, there's almost certainly something better out there for you to use, uh, which is going to be more memory efficient uh, without too much penalty for anything else. Now, Stefan's going to get stylish with some crashes. Yeah, the next puzzle is fun. It's about um, a stylish crash. So basically what it is about, it is about attributes in the Android namespace that, has been a that have been added in a higher API level. So um, let's say you have this application um, and your designer asks you to add a style to a button. So what you normally would do, um, you would create a style like this. It's pretty straightforward. You set a background drawable, you set a text color, um, and then you set the font family. Um, <clears throat> by the way, then you go ahead and look at the API docs and realize mm, Android font family was added in API 16. But then you might think, ah, oh, I've done this before. That might be not that big of an issue. The attribute has, added, has been added in API 16, um, and it's just going to be ignored. Um, but it turns out that sometimes that's not the case. So let's have a look at the same style, um, <clears throat> which we've seen uh, right now. But if you look closely, it's a little bit different. So instead of the attributes, we actually see integer values. Um, and the reason for that is that attributes are actually mapped to integer values, and these are hard-coded. So what sometimes happens is um, that you have third renders, um, which they actually add their own attributes under the, under the Android namespace. And <clears throat> um, if you're unlucky, they're using the same integer like Android font family. So uh, what the result of this is, is, is that your application will crash. And so um, the question is, how do you get around that? So <clears throat> the, f the first thing you might think about is, OK, I will just create a values minus uh, v16 folder um, and add my style in there. I mean, that's totally fine, and you can do it, and it will prevent you from crashes. Um, but the problem with that is it it duplicates your styles. And if, it's, if this is the only one, that's probably fine. But if, if this sums up, you have like a whole different um, uh, styles and other uh, resource files which are duplicated throughout the folders. And you really want to avoid that because um, you want to maintain your code, you want to refactor your code, and you really don't want to spend a half an hour um, <clears throat> just for, for changing some simple property. So what you really should do is this. Um, in your main styles XML, you just create um, another style, um, <coughs> which, I, which in this case is called text appearance my app base, and this style um, is actually referenced um, in my in my button style now. So um, if if you look at the bottom line, um, I'm now using the Android text appearance attribute, and I'm pointing to that style. And what I do now is I create another styles XML in my v16s uh, v16 folder. Um, and just override the property over there. Um, <clears throat> and so um, you're on the safe side. Um, and the other thing about this is um, this was only um, about a style, but it can happen everywhere where an attribute has been added in a higher APR level. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand over to Rich to talk Thank about you. shared preferences. Nice little tip. Shared preferences. There can't be anything wrong with shared preferences, right? They're simple. We all use them all the time. They're a great way of storing key value very quickly uh, from your activity, from your application. Even if you have a situation where you have, say, a broadcast receiver that's writing to shared preferences and an activity that's reading and writing to them, everything's fine. Everything's consistent, and it works quite nicely. But what if you're crossing a process boundary? What if you've got a broadcast receiver in one process and a service in another one? The broadcast receiver starts reading and writing to the shared preferences. The service starts reading and writing to them. And you notice some strange things happening. They're overwriting each other's preferences, or they're reading random values out. It's no longer consistent, and because this image up here isn't actually what you're getting. What you're getting is this. Each of the two processes has its own cached uh, copy of the shared preferences. And they're reading and writing to the storage pretty randomly. Uh, they are indeed overwriting each other's values. And if you are in uh, multiple processes, you get this issue. If you look in the API docs, you'll see that we have this flag for multi, uh, mode multiprocess. 
This isn't an ideal solution because it only works from API 11 upwards. And to be honest, there's a lot of edge cases when it comes to this kind of uh, reading and writing to files from multiple processes, so it's not a great solution. The only thing that you can really do is just make sure that your broadcast receiver is in the same process as your service. You can do that either in the manifest, in the manifest, in the manifest by declaring the Android process tag and giving them the same process, or you can make the broadcast receiver an inner class of the service. So just make sure that if you are doing this kind of stuff, uh, either move to your own data structure and don't use shared preferences, or put everything inside the same process to keep it consistent using that same uh, cached instance of shared preferences. Uh, Stefan, have you got any extra? Sometimes on my intents, yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, this is also a fun puzzle. Um, it's about intents. Um, intents uh, are something that Android developers use on, uh, on a daily basis. It's the glue between all the Android components. So, um, what a very common scenario is you have one activity and another, um, and you want, want to transfer data from one activity to the other. So, how do you do that? In general, you would just um, create an intent object put some data in there, <coughs> start the other activity, call the getIntent method, and get a reference to the intent. Um, and after that, you would then start um, reading your data from that intent. So um, looking at the API docs um, for intent um, actually uh, gives you two possibilities to do so. So <coughs> the first thing you can do is you can call getExtras and then get your uh, string from there. Um, or you could use a convenience method directly and call get string extra. Um, by just looking at these methods, um, there's nothing to spot there. It, it looks like it's very similar um, in terms of performance and also in terms of uh, uh, efficiency. But there's actually um, a huge difference. So um, who in this room thinks that the first method um, with the get extras, get string, um, is the more efficient one? A few. And who thinks that the get string extra, the convenience method, is the more efficient one? Okay, that's quite a lot. So <clears throat> we have a good audience, actually. Um, again, you're right. Um, you should always use the get data type extra method um, on the intent. The reason um, for that <coughs> uh, can be seen below in the code snippet. So this code snippet is actually taken um, from the source code of the intent. And what we can see here is that every time um, we call get extras, um, we will receive a full copy of the bundle. So what happens here is um, <coughs> all the extras um, which, which live in the intent will be copied to a new bundle and you will actually receive a copy um, which you're talking to. Um, this is not a bug, this is totally fine because if you think about um, <coughs> uh, encapsulation and abstract data types, you really don't want to expose your internal state to an external object but it, which then mutates your state and, and brings your bundle in, in kind, of, kind of a weird state. Um, but it's something you really should know because there's really a performance penalty involved in that. And even worse, let's say um, if you put data um, in your uh, bundle, in your intent, um, and you call get extras, you will always put this data in a copy. And if you hand over this intent to another uh, component, uh, let's say activity again, um, the data will never <coughs> um, arrive in that component because you have written the data to a copy. Um, so yes, um, are you guys still awake? <laughs> Excellent. This isn't a question to the audience. A quick scour of Stack Overflow shows that this is a pretty common problem. And this refers to broadcast receivers, alarm managers. So in the case the phone's asleep, the alarm manager wakes it up. It sends a, a broadcast, which your broadcast receiver picks up. And then your broadcast receiver, being a good broadcast receiver, starts a service. This is all fine. Looks great, very simple. It goes to testing, and it turns out the service isn't always starting. Sometimes it's starting at a random time. It doesn't really make sense at all. So what's actually going on here? Service doesn't start. If we look deeply, more deeply into it, the alarm manager's holding a wake clock. And it holds the wake clock for the whole of the broadcast manager's on receive method. And when on receive is finished, the wake clock is relinquished. And your, your call to start the service is an asynchronous call, and this is happening outside of that wake clock. And sometimes it happens after the wake clock's gone back and the device has gone back to sleep again, and then some unsuspecting user starts it up again in the future, and the service starts up. So what can you do? 
Uh, there's a few things you could do, I guess. Um, you could try and hold a wait clock inside the broadcast receiver. Uh, but you're not going to know how long until the service has actually started. So you could just kind of hold it for 60 seconds, maybe, and then start the service. But that makes me feel kind of dirty. And it should do, because it's not a very nice solution. Uh, but there is a simple answer to it. We have the wakeful broadcast receiver, which turns the diagram into something like this. And it does it via magic, maybe. Uh, or maybe witchcraft, I'm not sure. And if you look at what's actually happening, the alarm manager is holding the wake clock whilst the broadcast receiver is running. And then the broadcast receiver is holding a wake clock and storing a reference to it as a static global. And then in the intents for the service, it's passing that reference to the service. And then when the service starts up, it can release the wake clock itself. And there's clearly potential issues with this as well. If your service fails to start, then that wake lock is still held if there's a bug somewhere or it crashes. Uh, so the wakeful broadcast receiver does put a maximum time of 60 seconds on the start. Similar to the shared preferences problem we had earlier on, if you're crossing the process boundary with this, when you pass that reference to the wake lock to the service, the service isn't going to be able to read that reference and, uh, and release the wake lock. So again, if you're trying to do this, cross process boundaries, uh, it's best just not to. There isn't an easy solution. You could make something up where your broadcast receiver starts a service, which starts a service in another process, but it's all a bit messy. So the best thing to do, again, uh, is definitely to keep the broadcast receiver in the same process as the service that it's starting through either of the two methods before, make it in a class of the service, or declare it in the manifest. I think a lot of people have fallen foul of that one. And maybe... Um, Stack Overflow's got a good answer for it now anyway. OK, uh, Stefan's going to monkey about a bit. Yes, um, monkeys are Bugdroid's best friend, actually. Um, but monkeys sometimes do things the Bugdroid really doesn't want. And why you should care about this is very simple. Because what I'm talking about here um, is the monkey tool, um, which we ship with our tool. So. The monkey tool basically um, is a tool for stress testing your application. So what it does is it creates random input events. Let's say uh, <coughs> it creates uh, motion events, it creates key events, and it randomly injects it into the system and just hammers somewhere on the screen. So in order to use the monkey, um, it's, that's pretty simple. You just have to go to the command line, um, and we have an ADB command for that. Um, you can just call ADB shell monkey and specify your package name. Um, and then you can say, OK, I want to do 500 iterations. And really, 500 iterations means um, that you inject 500 events into the system. So now the monkey sits there and hammers on the bug droid and hammers on the bug droid. Um, but unfortunately, um, your uh, application does some things you really don't want a monkey to do. So, for example, a very common case is that you um, maintain accounts in your application. So you can maybe create accounts, you can maybe delete accounts, and that's probably something you don't want a monkey to do. Um, another very common thing is analytics. So you can make your manager very happy um, if you just plug 100 devices into your build servers and do a three hours monkey run every night and you will get <coughs> um, usage data um, from all those devices, um, but that's probably not what you want. Um, another case where you don't want the monkey to click on is, for example, if you sit at your desk and you're testing this video, uh, this video application or this application which plays audio um, and you have a monkey run and the monkey just plays the tracks and raises the volume and lowers the volume and it's very annoying for your coworkers. <clears throat> and the worst thing that might can happen is everything that costs money and that, that's expensive even on your server. Um, <clears throat> so how do you get around that? Actually, it's pretty easy. So if you look at the activity manager, there's a method called is user monkey. And what you generally would do, you would just <coughs> ask, is my user monkey? And if it is, you don't want to um, execute a destructive operation or method whatsoever um, to prevent the monkey to um, create accounts, um, play music, um, and all the other things uh, I mentioned. So you basically give him the permission, or you don't give him the permission. And it's a very valuable thing. Um, <clears throat> because 
I think Monkey is something that all the developers out there should use because it's, it's a very easy way to stress test your application and, and you can even spot very hard to catch bugs um, with it and also low hanging, low hanging fruits. But <coughs> speaking um, about permissions, um, our next puzzle is actually about permissions. Um, <coughs> so permissions um, are a, a fundamental part um, of uh, an Android application. So every time a user installs an application, the first thing he sees um, is uh, the list of permissions. So therefore, it's good practice to minimize your permissions. Um, and this puzzle basically um, really is about um, cases where you often see a permission, permission usage, but you don't actually need a permission in that case. So, for example, let's say um, you have this application um, <coughs> which shows uh, cheeses or uh, re recipes um, from the internet, um, and you want to offer a customer support. So, um, you have this link in a customer support, um, or you have this button um, where people can click on to actually call your customer support. So the first thing you come up with is, okay, I'm going to add a call phone permission and I'm doing everything on my own. Um, the problem why you might not want to do that um, is shown in the screenshot on the right because what then happens, the user installs your recipe app, um, but the first thing he sees is that your app can make calls and that it can cost him a lot of money. So um, at that point, the user might install your app but also might just not do it because it's because he thinks it's just not it's just dangerous and he thinks it's really it's a recipe app why why does it have to make phone calls um, <clears throat> so to get around that you can just use uh, Android so that's what Android was there for you have Android has reusable components and they're already there so you can just reuse them so in this case um, you probably just want the stock phone dialer um, and this is actually pretty easy. You just create an intent with, a, with the um, intent action dial and then start the activity. What will happen is that the stock dialer, which the user is already familiar with, will show up and the user can make the call uh, on your behalf. Even more important, and, and what you see a lot, um, is the usage of the um, reading contacts permission. So this is a permission that's very commonly used in a lot of apps. Um, and there are some cases where it's probably fine to use it, but in most of the cases that we see, um, you, could actually, you actually don't need this permission at all. Because what you can do is very similar to what we did with the phone dialer. Um, you could just create an intent um, for an action pick, then you specify um, the URI of the contacts provider, and then you call start activity for result. What will happen is, is that the contacts, um, the contacts picker of the system, which the user is already familiar with, um, shows up. The user just picks a contact and you get a callback in your activity. And <coughs> um, this callback contains an intent, which actually contains a URI to that contact. So um, previous Android 2.3, this was still kind of a pain um, because there was only, only a couple of metadata in there, which was in most of the cases not valuable. And then you had to re-add the uh, read contacts permission to actually create a content provider. But this has changed with Android 2.3. And since Android 2.3, what actually happens is, is that the contact picker grants you a URI permission. And <coughs> so if you get your callback, you can ju then just go ahead and query the contacts provider and you will get all the metadata of the contact, which is also fine in that context because the user explicitly um, chose this contact. So um, <coughs> uh, uh, URI permissions um, ha has been in Android for quite a while. So it's not some magic that happens within the contact picker. Um, you can take advantage of this yourself. Let's say um, you have a note app for example, um, and you want to expose nodes to other apps. So what you would do is you would just add the grant URI permissions attribute and set it to true. Um, and then in your code, you would just create an intent and then add the um, intent flag grant read URI permission. There's also a flag for write. 
um, and then pass that intent um, to, your, to your caller, to your client, um, and then the caller can access uh, the node in your content provider. Um, you can also do this from code, um, but you have to be more careful because if you grant the permission, you have to revoke it afterwards. Um, and another fun fact about it is um, URI permissions are actually um, persistent across application restarts. So um, if, you don't, if you don't reboot your phone, or as long as you don't reboot your phone, um, these permissions are uh, still valid in that case until you revoke it in code. So, yes. Okay. It's puzzle, code style. We've been firing puzzles at you for 25 minutes now, so a bit of a change of pace. I'll tell you a story instead. You might have noticed these little uh, Android API logos throughout the presentation, and you might have noticed they've got absolutely nothing to do with the puzzles that we've been talking about. They've just been popping up because they're kind of cute. But in this one, it's quite meaningful. This poor guy here, the, uh, the little uh, black and blue bug droid, he's in a bit of trouble. Uh, not only is he almost extinct because his platform version is now only 0.1% of the active Android devices out there, but he's planning for his redundancy. And he's planning by becoming an Android developer and building applications. He knows how to do it. He's using views and styles. And as long as uh, his styles are in XML, his views are in XML, he's a very happy little bee. He's, uh, he's following the guidelines, and he's writing very easy to maintain code. But today, he comes into work, and he realizes he, had to, he has to add in uh, a new element, a new view element, uh, programmatically into his code, the poor little thing. So he ends up with this. But of course, he wants to keep it maintainable, and he wants to still use those styles that he's already spent all the time defining in XML. He has a flick through, and there's definitely there's no set style methods for these view elements. But the clever little bee, he's got a little trick up his sleeve. He notices another constructor, the def style attribute, default style attribute constructor for the button. And he knows what it means. First of all, if you just put a zero in here, you're not going to get a default style, and you get an unstyled button, which is something a bit different. But a default style attribute, the little b goes off into his attributes.xml file, creates the declare, declare styleable excuse me, uh, XML tag, which usually you would use to put custom attributes in your own views. And he puts a reference attribute in there, which refers to the my button style, which is in his theme. His theme looks like this. You've got the style at the top of the theme, uh, the app theme. And in there, you've got the item name my button style. So the new reference he's put in his attributes refers directly to this button style, which has got the style of all the buttons in there. So now he can go off, and with the new, that constructor, he can pass this attribute straight into the constructor, and he gets his lovely little buzz off button, because that's what he's building right now to save his career. And Stefan's going to have a linear layout fight. Yeah, this puzzle is actually more a fight uh, than a puzzle. So in this fight, we have two contenders. So two linear layouts. So in the left corner, we have a linear layout with a horizontal orientation. And in the right corner, we have a horizontal layout um, with a vertical orientation. So let's have a look how this looks. So the layouts are quite similar. Um, as you can see, it's only a linear layout containing two buttons. Um, <clears throat> But one of those layouts takes longer to lay out and render. Um, and the question is, which of those two um, is it? So again, um, I want to ask the audience, do you think um, that the one, the contender on the left, the linear layout with a horizontal orientation, <coughs> takes longer to render and lay out than the contender on the right, the vertical orientation? Who thinks the vertical wins over the, over the horizontal? Uh, that's quite yeah. even. Yeah. That's quite Maybe even. Maybe more vertical. <clears throat> so the answer to the question is the contender in the left, the linear layout with the horizontal orientation, takes longer to render. Um, actually, it needs an extra layout pass. And the reason for that is that linear layout always tries to base align views. In that case, we have two buttons, um, which are where the text is already aligned. So it's actually kind of unnecessary um, to have that second layout pass. But <clears throat> there's this attribute you might have heard of, which is called baseline aligned. And it's uh, by default set to true. Um, and so in that case, um, if you just set it to false, you will save a whole layout pass. And that might be not 
a big of a deal if you have like only one layout, but if you have deep view hierarchies with nested linear layouts, um, <coughs> this can become a problem. And now we're going to see you know, some demo uh, from Rich on actually how to debug a web view. So how do you debug a web view? This has totally been shoehorned into a puzzler's talk because it didn't used to be possible. It didn't used to be possible, it didn't used to be possible. And now it is possible. You debug a web view on Android now with KitKat, we have the Chrome-based web view. And if you're on a debug uh, keys phone, you can just debug your web view anyway. And if you're on a release phone, you're gonna need to add one line of code into your application, webview.setwebcontents debuggable true. And of course, we've API gated it here to make sure you don't uh, break on previous versions. So I'm plugging my phone into, into our USB cable here. If it's not gonna slip off, this would be ridiculous. And open Google Books. And the, you just go in a Chrome web browser to Chrome colon inspect. Where is it? I can only see it on this screen here. Chrome colon inspect. I can only see it on this screen here. Chrome colon inspect. And what you see now is this awesome screen. Chrome has figured out that there's a Nexus 5 connected. This is my Nexus 5 here on the right hand side. And it's given me the option to inspect the web view that's currently active on the Nexus 5. What's even more awesome is right at the top, there's a the little, this is never going to reach up there. Discover, there it is, discover USB devices button. And the Chrome engineers have taken the tiny bits of ADB that they need and built them into the Chrome DevTools so that even if you don't have Android DevTools installed on your machine, or say you're on a Chromebook, for example, you can still do all this debugging. You can walk up to your, uh, your web developer and plug it into his machine and tick that box and it will find the device straight away as long as USB debugging is turned on. So I like that quite a lot. I don't need to turn it on because I do have Android DevTools installed and the ADB server is already running. So Chrome Inspect finds my device on the right hand side and uh, shows me that we've got a web view to inspect. So I can go down and hit inspect on it and the Chrome DevTools will start up and it will be the Chrome DevTools if any of you have done any web development that you know. It looks exactly the same. And as I move my mouse up and down through the DevTools, live on the screen of my phone, you can see the divs that I'm hovering over uh, lighting up and being highlighted on the phone. So I'm going to just have a little deep dive down through some of these. I want to find the content of this book. It's harder from over here than I thought. Maybe it's easier if I look at the screen behind me. And we can get to the title, it's gonna be inside here. I wanna get the, the caption of the image. You can see again, it's showing me all the divs live and it's showing me the size of the divs. And not only can we do this debugging and see what's actually happening, we can edit it live on the device as well. So I can go down, find the text and say is, and it should appear when I hit enter, it really did on the screen of the phone as well. Something crazy just happened. <laughs> That's what I'm seeing on my screen too. Oh, it's coming back again. It's <laughs> I think I've just been fumbled. Yeah. <laughs> it's clearly a video that's running, isn't it? How do we get through a... No. This is me now magically coding. Either way, whatever's happened to the uh, display over there, it can't deal with what's going through it right now. Where this video does go is after we've changed the... It's going to restart the video again. Or maybe I'll just play the video. No, it's carried on. Where it does go is we also run through all the different dev tools that you've got inside uh, Chrome DevTools here. You've got all your resources. You can browse the resources that are currently loaded on the page, the network, the sources, the timeline, you can do the record on the timeline, look at all the frames, the events, the memory usage, everything that's happening live inside the web view of the device right now. It means that you don't have to keep, I don't care about that. It means that you don't have to keep uh, rebuilding your application, changing the content in it, and then uh, bundling it onto a phone and testing it. This is just so much more awesome when, uh, when it's not flickering around like this. So clearly what's just happened uh, is gonna raise another question, which is how do you do screen recording like that on Android? So we'll just skip on to that, see if this one works. Uh, so Android KitKat also has a new screen recording function, and you just have to go ADB shell screen record SD card. Let's see if this works any better. And you do 
Devbox MP4 and hit enter, and then I can play with the phone here, switch forwards and backwards through some pages of the book, and then Control-C kills it, and then I can pull it back off the device again, and then open the video, and you can see the video that just got recorded. So now you can use that for your marketing purposes, upload it to the Play Store, whatever you want. You get a great high-resolution, high-frame rate video of whatever's live on the screen. So along with the web debugging tools, which are awesome, and, uh, and screen recording, two great new features that went into KitKat. And yeah, maybe we could mention, um, you've seen it, uh, you can actually really change the CSS, you can delete notes um, from the DOM, um, and it will immediately sync up with the device. So um, you should really try this out, because I think it's, it's, it's very awesome, and you can debug your web views um, <coughs> in a way that it was not possible before, so um, you should really take advantage of that. Excellent. <laughs> with that, I'd like to thank you for puzzling along with us today. Um, we'll be around for questions for a bit if you'd like to ask any. And enjoy what's left of DevOps. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? There's microphones around. Oh, you can shout. We can try shouting. Uh, only if they've either set that flag for you or if you're on uh, a phone debug with builds. debug keys, a debug build of Android. So if I run Google Boost on a Google with debug keys, uh -huh. I can just debug the update web view. the same settings to get perfect copies of all my books. Well, they're not perfect copies because you've got all the HTML around them, but yeah, potentially, yeah. You can set the debugging flag to false if you want, just like when you're doing screen recording. Uh, you could say the same thing, that you could just use a screen recording, record a film off, but the applications can set uh, surface view security to true, and then you can't make the record or you can't do the debug. So you can secure them up. Hey. Can you repeat? I, with the I monkey tool, does it log somewhere problems that you encounter whilst it's playing with your application? Um, what it does, you, you can provide it with a seed, um, and if it crashes, um, <coughs> you, you can start the monkey tool uh, by providing a seed, and then it just crashes. So it basically, it does not log anything. It basically just crashes. But if you have the seed, you can then reproduce it. <coughs> In which case, I think that's it. Thank you all very much, and enjoy the rest of DevOps. <laughs>